Hello everyone, my name is Wendy Myers of MyersDetox.com. Thanks so much for joining me today on the podcast. Um, I love doing this podcast every week and informing you guys about heavy metal toxicity and the importance of detoxing every area of your life. Today we have my friend Julie Donaldson on the show and we're going to be talking about estrogen dominance and estrogen toxicity. This is a huge problem. So many women suffer from hormonal issues, from infertility, reproductive issues, from low libido, and there's there's so many things working against our hormones, the plastics, our beauty products, and so many uh, pesticides that are put on our food, uh, so many toxins that interfere in our hormonal health. And we're going to provide some answers today, some clues as to you know what's going on in your body and some solutions on how to reverse estrogen toxicity and estrogen dominance. And, um, and also how to prevent estrogen toxicity. And also, interestingly, the connection between estrogen tox- toxicity and SIBO, which is small intestinal bowel overgrowth. It's an infection of good bacteria in your intestines that a lot of people suffer from and may not know why or can't figure it out. And we're going to talk about the difference between estrogen dominance and estrogen toxicity. Really, really good show today. Um, if you want to learn about detoxification, you know, I've worked with thousands of clients and I've distilled down my top 10 tips to detox like a pro and I put it into a simple checklist that you can download at detoxforenergy.com. Just go there, type in your email and we'll send you this free checklist and it really helps to distill down like all the top tips, really simple things that you can do at your home with diet in regards to uh, like simple supplements that you can take to detox your body. Really, really simple tips. So just go to detoxforenergy.com. And I'm so excited this week. I, my friend Connie Zach at Sunlight and Sauna is sending me a new infrared sauna. Um, I have had one of their Sunlight and Saunas for a while and it died on me because I used it so much. <laughs> so they're sending me a brand new one. I'm so excited. I'm getting a three person uh, conquer. It's like eucalyptus wood and it's got like chromotherapy. It's like light therapy inside of it. And it's got sound therapy and it's so many amazing features that I, I'm so excited to use it. It's, it's called three in one. It's got near mid and far infrared technology in it and it pulses the infrared rays because it helps them to penetrate deeper into your skin and really maximize the detox effect. And a lot of people don't realize that, you know, when you're going into a regular sauna, say at your gym, you're getting a lot of heat. It's kind of a dry heat, but it's really difficult to stay in that type of sauna for very long and really experience all the benefits that a sauna can give you for detoxification. But with an infrared sauna, the temperature inside the sauna is much lower because the infrared rays penetrate your tissue and heat you from the inside out. And they also kind of vibrate your cells to help them release the toxins. And they work in a lot of different ways so that your sweat that you produce is much more productive with toxins. It has much more toxins in it than sweat from a typical sauna, though that's very effective for detoxification. So needless to say, I'm super excited. I'm getting a brand new sauna in a couple weeks, and I'm going to be doing some videos on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Wendy Myers, and just show you all about it and teach you all about the importance of using an infrared sauna for a long, healthy, disease-free, medication-free life. I can't emphasize enough the importance of using an infrared sauna. If you want to learn more about saunas, you can go to myersdetox.com slash infrared dash sauna. I've got tons of information to, you know, just teach you all about the different types of saunas, how they detox you and all the different benefits of infrared saunas. So our guest today, Julie Donaldson, uh, she's a very good friend of mine and she has over 36 years of experience in the healing arts. She still works with clients. She's an amazing practitioner and she works as a metabolic typing individualized nutrition expert. Um, It's a certain type of uh, metabolic typing you can do to find out what type of diet is right for you. It's really, really interesting. 
Um, she does functional health testing. She does biomeridian assessment and massage therapy. And she brings a broad knowledge base to the partnership between herself and her clients. And she's dedicated to the discovery of the whole person in the healing journey and helping clients to establish supportive core beliefs and daily practices to achieve their health goals. Julie's own personal experience with illness and a need for integrative solutions contributes a great understanding to what people are experiencing and how to achieve this balance. And she's praised as an excellent listener and investigator. She brings the compassion of a person who has been significantly ill to the table in a very meaningful way. Julie specializes in the areas of GI dysfunction, women's health, children's health, and spectrum nutrition, autoimmune disease, methylation dysfunction, thyroid imbalances, viral, retroviral conditions, and mood disorders. And with each of these specialties, she applies individual investigations and appropriate testing choices with measurable follow-up procedures. You can learn more about Julie at truenaturehealthconsulting.com. Julie, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Thank you, Wendy. I'm so happy to be here with you. Why don't we talk a little bit about you know how you got into the health field? Absolutely. Love, always love to tell that story. Uh, kind of the uh, uh, wounded warrior story, if you will. Um, my uh, entry into the field came uh, it really honestly in two different ways. First, in, uh, in my early 20s, I went through uh, very um, closely packed and tragic deaths of three people very close in my life. And it uh, threw me into a tailspin of depression, inability to digest, inability to detoxify, um, just uh, all of my systems were down. And um, I was on a path uh, to do a PhD in psychology and I uh, moved off that path and went into alternative health. Um, first trained as a massage therapist because I uh, was partially healed by someone in that profession and then I moved on to functional health um, and uh, on to clinical nutrition from there and that's uh, a big piece of how it happened. Several years later, also, I began to experience another health crisis uh, in response to um, this type of toxicity we're going to talk about today. Um, I grew up in um, Florida in the middle of citrus groves that were sprayed aerially every mm. other day. <laughs> with intense pesticides. Um, I started to have a lot of hormonal issues, uh, very difficult uh, cycling and symptoms during my cycling, again, digestive issues. Um, and uh, then as I began to uh, be pregnant, uh, suffered miscarriage, uh, suffered with my son, a very, very preterm birth which we both survived, but uh, all of which could be related back to many of these toxin and hormone problems. So, yeah, and yeah. that's what we're gonna talk about today about estrogen and estrogen toxicity, estrogen dominance. And this oh. is a very important topic. I did one podcast about this long, 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 long time ago, many years ago, um, but I really think it is uh, one of the more important topics of our time. I was just having a discussion today uh, with someone about that, about how all the pesticides, plastics, beauty products, so many things we're putting on and in our body are mimicking estrogen in our body, are causing you know, infertility issues, animals to be born, hermaphrodites, you know, male suffering, having smaller testes. And right. uh, there's a lot of, of health issues, cancers around estrogen dominance and estrogen toxicity. So let's talk a little bit about the difference between those two. Uh, talk sure. to me about the difference between estrogen dominance and estrogen toxicity. Right, and that's a great question because it is very frequently misunderstood. Uh, people assume that they come uh, packaged together <laughs> and they don't necessarily, okay? Dominance is um, essentially explained by excess, okay? When they're, and, and it's very much relative to the balance of all of the sex hormones in the body. So if there is way too much 
estrogen uh, in relationship to progesterone, testosterone, all of these other hormones, that's where we look at dominance, okay? Um, and there can be dominance uh, existing even in a state of deficiency, okay? So someone who experiences deficient symptoms uh, can also be dominant yes. because, uh, again, it's a relative thing, okay? Um, and, and the difference is that in dominance, there might still be proper metabolizing of the estrogen, but uh, there's just too much of it. There is an excess of it. Okay. Whereas with toxicity, it is really an issue of those metabolites being broken down properly. Yes. Right. Um, so it's um, and these are fat soluble agonistic metabolites that are binding and aggressive that is the that is the definition of agonistic you know they are they are problematic when they're not methylated so we're really looking at is this a question of the body is producing too much estrogen and lots of different reasons for that as well um, or is it an issue of the body might be producing a normal amount of estrogen, but it is not detoxifying those metabolites properly? Yes. Okay? Right. Now, yeah. What are some of the symptoms of estrogen toxicity? Well, symptoms of either one can be very similar, um, although I would say with toxicity, um, there is a little bit less of the um, uh, menstrual-related um, symptoms. In dominance, we see more of the breast tenderness, the moodiness. Moodiness can happen with either one. Um, but uh, headaches, um, toxicity, we see more headaches, we see more brain fog. Um, we see moodiness that is not necessarily connected to the cycle. It's more of a perpetual type of a thing. Um, difficulty with being around any type of aromatics, even sometimes the natural ones. Uh, people with toxicity will certainly respond negatively to perfumes and uh, chemical types uh, 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 aromatics, but many of them also can respond negatively to natural ones as well. So, yeah. Yeah, and so let's talk about how estrogen toxicity happens. I mean, we know that there's so many uh, plastics, you know, there's pesticides, there are uh, beauty products, we're putting uh, parabens and other types of, um, you know, toxins, perfumes or estrogenic, uh, so many cl cleaning products. Uh, talk to us a little mm -hmm. bit more about uh, how exactly we become estrogen toxic. Yeah, great. Another great question. So um, I want to back up for a minute because this this was a, a, a major period of time in my functional practice where I began to notice these correlations. I used to uh, practice only in person, one on one with people with a system called BioMeridian, which is an, uh, an electrodermal uh, testing system. And uh, time and time and time again, I was seeing these phenolic compounds coming up as issues in people's systems, okay? And the, the, the relationship is between what you just mentioned, and I call them the, uh, the three big Ps, which are um, perfumes, <laughs> uh, pesticides, plastics, Okay, petrols of any kind, yes. really, petroleum-based products of any kind, PAHs, BPAs, uh, all of these things that are um, related to uh, uh, or included uh, as petroleum. So the interesting thing that I began to see is that um, phenolics have uh, all the same biochemical structure. And it doesn't matter if they are perfumes, including natural aromatics, or they are petrol-based products, pesticides, <laughs> plastics, hormones, and foods. There are many foods that are in the phenolic uh, category as well. Uh, lots of the uh, browning fruits, lots of the darker fruits, chocolate, coffee, 
um, alcohol, uh, these are all phenolic compounds. So given the world that we live in, and this, this was really where I began this observation 20 plus years ago, um, and uh, understood that what's, what, what ends up happening is we get mistaken identity. You know, there, all of these other things are flooding the body, and they're using the same receptor sites as the hormones, okay? So what happens is the brain is saying, I don't have enough estrogen, um, because it's not locked on to the receptor site. Something petroleum-based or other type of phenol-based may be locked on to that receptor site, okay? And or a person is potentially also dealing with poor detoxification of those elements, right? So they don't move out of the body, they stay, and they're taking up space. And um, the estrogen is not making it where it needs to go. And estrogens are, are critical. They're, they're very important to lots of different functions in the body, including in the gut, which we'll uh, talk about uh, in relationship to the SIBO. So I began to note that many people were struggling with this and uh, in a time clearly when we we're watching toxins just go off the charts, right? Mm -hmm. And also in a time where hormone replacement is becoming very popular. <laughs> and um, yeah, because people's hormones are, are not in a state of balance, they are experiencing these symptoms and it became sort of the new fad to address that uh, through replacement, right? Yes. So people become toxic. Uh, also weight gain is a huge deal here, okay? Estrogen toxicity and estrogen dominance as well are both fed by excess weight and fat, okay? Yes. Yeah, because so, fat actively produces estrogen, correct? Yes, exactly. Um, and if you are just producing too much estrogen, as likewise, uh, I know this is a, a topic very close to your heart, if you are toxic, period, your body is going to collect fat as well, okay? Because we are, um, it, it's a safe haven for, for those toxins, right? Okay, so um, when we are um, dealing with too much fat, we're then going to um, be collecting these toxins, collecting more estrogens, and uh, having the body have an improper response to what is actually in the system, okay? So you may already have lots of estrogen in the system, but the brain is not perceiving it that way. The brain is perceiving there's very little, and it's constantly instructing uh, the glands, the pituitary and the adrenal glands to produce more. Okay, so again, we can go back to, well, if there's more being produced, is it being broken down and metabolized properly, or are we getting a um, uh, some kind of a toxin situation going on, right? So the epigenetic exposures um, are chronic at this point, um, uh, as we see this beginning of increase in estrogen toxicity, right? We see this also alongside uh, 1960s and 70s use of lots of containers, right? Yes. <laughs> um, and bad diet. We're, we're looking at lots of packaged junk and uh, people are gaining weight, people are gaining toxicity, right? So, um, and um, the, the, the hormones that are being released uh, and, the, uh, and the hormone mimicking uh, compounds that are being released into water are another huge issue. We're seeing microfibers of plastic in water now. People are showering in this, right? Some people are drinking it. Many people are only drinking filtered water, but this is another big area uh, of exposure for people, right? Oh, yes. Yeah, water is yeah. huge because even if you're drinking filtered water, you're you're soaking in all the toxins and chemicals in your shower water. It's, it, you know, that's most people today, unless they have a, a whole house water filter. 
Yes, but a lot of people don't know this. I'm surprised by how many people do not know this. Yes. Uh, when I talk to people, they say, oh, well, I'm, dr I'm drinking filtered water. I'm drinking really good water. And I say, are you aware in a 10-minute in a shower, you are absorbing a gallon of water? Mm -hmm. through your lungs and your skin yeah. and if and if that gallon is full of microfibers of plastic there you go okay and um, it, it's yeah it's a, it's a very difficult thing so toxicity happens by the malfunction basically of the two pathways in the body of COMT right and CYP mm -hmm. okay and um, if, if either or both of those are not working properly, we, because estrogen has to be broken down in those two phases. First, it goes through the CYP 1A1, 1B1 pathways, and then it goes through uh, COMT, okay, which is um, basically um, catalyzing the transfer of methyl uh, groups from S adenosyl methionine, right, to um, the uh, catecholamines of dopamine, serotonin, uh, etc. Okay. And when those processes are broken down, we end up with these toxic remaining metabolites from the estrogens. Okay. That can be clearly very dangerous to the body. Yes. So what are some of the, the best methods to resolve estrogen toxicity? Well, um, uh, we need to assess and address a lot of things, as we've just been talking about. We need to assess and address what the environmental factors are that are uh, a big risk for people. Um, we need to uh, help people understand how to live and eat ecologically right? Reducing the amount of uh, packaging, reducing the amount of time wasted of a food uh, moving to someone's uh, plate. We need to remove those heavy metals from, uh, because heavy metals are also now being understood to um, uh, create excess binding uh, uh, for estrogens as well. There's a lot of information coming out around that. So a person's overall toxic load, not just the, the, the peas that we've mentioned um, that are the biggies, but everything. Uh, because also we're, we're looking at the fact that estrogen toxicity as well as heavy metal toxicity or any type of toxicity is going to cause a reduction in the cofactors that are needed to deal with any type of toxicity, right? So when I'm working with someone who uh, uh, is either has known estrogen toxicity or um, might need to investigate whether they have toxicity, I'm not just looking at the hormones because if there's malfunction there, we can almost guarantee there is malfunction in overall detoxification systems. And why is that happening? Likely there is a burden that needs to be removed as well, right? Yeah, and the so, liver, the liver can be a major bottleneck as well because the liver metabolizes excess estrogen. And it's yes. one of the re reasons I, I do and recommend coffee enemas because mm -hmm. that really helps that liver get, get functioning a lot better because our liver has to break down so many toxins, including uh, estrogens. Exactly. Yes, and gallbladder as well. Mm -hmm. okay. And this is a this is another thing that I work really hard to help people understand that it uh, you know, and I know you know this with your work as well. That lots of people are about oh, let's do a liver cleanse, and uh, if you are hormone toxic, very bad idea. Mm. Very bad idea. Mm -hmm. There are certain things you can use to support yourself safely, but if your if your methylation pathways and or your excretion functions are not working, and I don't just mean eliminating, I, I mean actually uh, the body uh, through that particular phase of detoxification being able to get a toxin out of the bowel, okay? Many times they are reabsorbed, and this is a big issue, and this is where coffee enemas and other types of supports are really amazing uh, to help the body, uh, help the gallbladder 
uh, do more efficiently what it's supposed to be doing, right? Uh, producing bile, and uh, of course, bile carries toxins. So great, we we encourage the production of the bile. We also have to look at is the bile um, and what it brings each time a person eats. Is it actually being emptied? Are the toxins that the liver has put into that bile being taken away, or are they reabsorbing? It's a major problem just yes. because our bodies were not designed to deal with this amount of toxicity, and it's an evolutionary problem, and we'll be a good thousand years probably turning that around and having the body uh, come to any better uh ideas functions yeah. around that right yeah that's why it's so important to support the body uh with different detox protocols and supplements yeah. Uh, yeah. can you talk about some of your favorite ones to support estrogen yes absolutely um and uh i uh i i am a huge fan of the coffee enema i love to see the coffee enema be supported with binders, which is something that you talk about. We're all uh, in this industry using at this point, because again, we've all probably experienced and we've understood that when we start to push the system, whether it's, uh, and, and a coffee enema is a type of push. It's not a huge push. It's a pretty safe one, but um, it still can in people who are very toxic and whose, uh, whose systems are not working at optimal function, it can create some difficulty in terms of uh, response to that. So grabbing with a binder uh, in addition to using a coffee enema is wonderful. So we, we look at both COMT and how we support COMT with certain supplements and CYP, okay? Um, CYP, which again is first step, Okay. And we'll, we'll talk about how we assess and address, how, how, how we actually look and verify it, you know, how someone uh, to know that someone has this problem. But uh, DIM, uh, diandiol methane, is probably uh, the number one uh, response uh, supplementally, naturally to estrogen toxicity, okay? Um, it is a phytochemical that is, um, uh, uh, occurs naturally from the degradation of cruciferous vegetables, the digestion of cruciferous vegetables. Well, not everyone tolerates cruciferous vegetables, especially if we have a SIBO situation, right, um, connected to estrogen toxicity. We can't do cruciferous vegetables. So this is that concentrated boiled down. And it is much safer than um, IC, uh, I, uh, I3C and all 3 uh, carbonyl, which is the compound that comes from the digestion of uh, uh, cruciferous, or a compound found in cruciferous. So DIM is one of the first things, although we always have to assess um, how much dominance do we have versus how much um, uh, toxicity do we have, okay? DIM is critical in um, definitely in cases of high amounts of estrogen and especially in cases of uh, high amounts of the dangerous estrogens, the 4-OH and the 16-OH, okay? Mm -hmm. um, there are uh, a couple of other things that are really helpful if uh, the healthy estrogens are in normal range, but the dangerous ones are higher uh, versus, uh, so instead of lowering all estrogens, which DIM can do, we might focus on something like elagic acid, which uh, has some properties to reduce those dangerous ones specifically. It's a, it's a type of antioxidant. Mm -hmm. um, so that's another one. Um, chase tree. Uh, it can be extremely helpful because it can both detoxify estrogen to a, to a small amount, but lifts progesterone mm, yes. as well. So we're working back towards that balance again between those. Um, again, what I just spoke about, increasing bile, um, increasing glucuronidation through the use of calcium deglucurate, excuse me, cholagogic foods like artichokes, 
uh, beets, beet greens, Jerusalem artichokes, all those types of things which um, help us produce more bile. Um, and then the use of binders for grabbing some of these things that we're, you know, getting more storage with in the bile. Okay. Um, there is also uh, evidence uh, lately that DEM uh, can be anti-cancer and anti-infection. <laughs> so uh, in cases where we have both estrogen toxicity and SIBO, it's, it's a really wonderful choice. Okay? I'm going to emphasize we're, we're talking about natural choices here, and most of these are very safe, but it is very important, in my opinion, that people think about being tested. Don't just try to treat this by themselves because there can be toxicity with deficiency. And if you start slapping certain things on just because a, a symptom tells you that you might have something, many symptoms can be caused by many different root sources, right? So. Um, when we're dealing with toxicity, and especially a type of toxicity like this that can be cancer-causing, right? Very good idea to be tested, assessed, allow someone to help you develop a really good, comprehensive, and individual approach. What kind of test do you like? Uh, well, the Dutch hormone test is the gold standard, definitely, for estrogen toxicity. Uh, it's pretty much the only thing I use anymore um, because it does show us uh, all of the individual levels of all of the hormones, um, uh, but it also shows us the capacity. It shows us the function of these two really critical pathways, the CYP and the COMT don't know of another test that's doing that so yes. it's strict and, and it, it is no more expensive than in you know any other type of testing really especially where you're really looking to get the right information it just takes us straight in to what we really need okay and I am pretty much always a proponent of doing a hair analysis in this situation yes. um, yeah, I know you're a big proponent of that as well uh, and particularly because while we can see what the capacities are of these pathways for breaking down the metabolites, the hair test is also an incredible way to see what the, and cheap way, cheap, in a, you know, it's, it's not expensive, it's non-invasive, it's very easy to do, and someone who's trained to understand them can see through those results, what type of excretion a person is actually getting. There are certain indicators in that test that tell us, well, we, we've got this much showing up, but does that mean that that's all that's there? Okay, so, and that relates on the hair test primarily to heavy metal, right? But excretory function is going to be very similar no matter what the toxin is, right? We're back to that whole question of uh, are we getting it broken down? Is it detoxified, whatever the substance is? Is it stored in the bile? And then when it's released, is it being taken out or is it being retained? And that's a very cool thing that can be seen in a hair analysis. So it's a piece that helps us understand um, uh, you know, what, what is going on in addition to the, the methylation pieces, the yes. excretory piece, yeah. A stool test is also sometimes very helpful in this case. And again, of course, uh, if, if, if there are bacterial issues alongside um, estrogen uh, toxicity, uh, we want to know that, we want to be working with that, and they do have many links with one another. Um, there are elevations in um, uh, certain markers on a, stool, on a good stool test. Again, I'm kind of back to the gold standard. I use the GI map uh, pretty strictly. That does not diagnose SIBO, but it diagnoses all kinds of other or identifies all kinds of other uh, pathogens. But it will give us a clue uh, with uh, uh, an elevation in something called beta-glucuronidase that tells us that these functions are not working properly and they are associated with bacterial disturbances typically, okay? So 
yeah, these, these, these things all kind of work in tandem to get a uh, relatively um, easy assessment of where someone's overall systems are. Okay. Yeah. And let's talk a little bit about the connection between estrogen toxicity and SIBO. Okay. You've mentioned SIBO a few times. Tell us, you know, for anyone that doesn't know what that is, what exactly is SIBO and what's the connection there? Yeah, well, SIBO is uh, the increase in both uh, types and numbers of bacteria in the small intestine, uh, which is uh, under normal circumstances sterile. Okay, uh, and these are bacteria that have unfortunately arrived in the small intestine from the large intestine, which is where they belong and where the colonies are uh, in numbers to fight anything that is pathogenic and not helpful, right? Um, uh, commensal or uh, dangerous in any way. Um, why does this happen is, is the question. Um, in my opinion, and again, this is something that I have been developing in clinical practice for many years now, and it all started with observation. I think that one of the big issues is uh, we know that uh, the ileocecal valve uh, is what's allowing that bacteria to come back up from the large intestine into the small intestine where it does not belong, okay? Um, I personally think that the valve gets damaged by toxicity, hmm. okay? Round and round and round and round it goes. And we are, you know, we, we know this on many other levels with uh, heavy metals and all kinds of other things that they damage tissue, right? Uh, they damage joints. And the, um, th these tissues in the gut are very, very vulnerable, okay? Uh, the, the, the barriers are thin, they're um, delicate and, uh, again, not made for the types of onslaught that we are having, okay? So I do feel that that is one contributing factor. Other contributing factors uh, are that um, in, in, in both of these cases, we have, um, uh, we have oxidative stress going on. Okay, uh, there, there's a lot of connection in SIBO with high oxidative stress through the increase in cytokines that happens and decreases in antioxidants. Again, we talked about no matter what uh, we were talking about toxicity, now I'm equating it with this particular bacterial problem. We see the same thing. We see reduction in glutathione. We see reduction in B vitamins, in zinc, in choline, all, all kinds of things that are critical to keeping the body properly cleansed. Okay? So uh, they're partnered up here. Um, and uh, it, it's kind of happening in both directions that the bacteria itself and, and its threat in the small intestine is creating some of the same problems as toxicity is creating. Okay. Yeah. Um, we also have uh, um, in SIBO uh, lipid peroxidation. Okay, and that's where we have uh, free radicals stealing uh, electrons uh, and damaging cells, which again is part of what I feel is happening to the valve and allowing that valve to not function properly and uh, bacteria escaping. Um, lipid peroxidation also inv involves uh, end products uh, of aldehydes. Aldehydes are phenolics. <laughs> okay, here we are, back in this circle again mm -hmm. with these compounds that can be so deleterious, right? So, yeah, let's talk a little bit about, um, like, so are there ways to prevent estrogen toxicity in your opinion? I know it's, it's, there's so many estrogenic toxins in our environment, it's pretty hard to avoid them. It is. Um, so we have to, first of all, be educated about what they are and how we can avoid them. It's easy enough not to buy perfumed detergents 
and cleaning products and things that are dangerous to everyone. That's easy enough to do. Sometimes we can't uh, out and about in the world avoid the contact. We can avoid plastics. We can avoid cooking in plastics. Um, we can um, not avoid uh, petrochemicals of many kinds. We can't avoid gas. We're all living amongst it. So we have to know how to move it in our bodies. Okay? Um, as, as I think you know, I am a metabolic nutritionist. My first step with people is to stabilize the body with individual nutrition, okay? Uh, because it allows all systems to function on a better level. It allows everything uh, to work better because it maximizes the production of ATP, which is gas to every single engine in the body, every single cell, okay? So I think that is absolutely critical. And again, food sources, are as critical, uh, removing um, pesticides, insecticides, all types of petrochemicals from what we're ingesting in our, in our food. Um, the um, importance of a joyful and peaceful and balanced life cannot be underestimated because we are also dealing with the hypothalamus pituitary axis when we are talking about hormones. Um, if we're dealing with genetic predisposition, uh, that can only be dealt with uh, in an individual through these epigenetic choices, as well as the choices of the best uh, suited natural supplements for that person and the particular situation that they're in. And as we all know, um, epigenetics, when handled properly, can very frequently turn off those genetic switches, right? Um, and uh, have things be running more smoothly. So I think that it's very important to um, assess an individual, um, uh, clearly removing most of the offending substances um, and uh, living as clean and as local as possible. Uh, when we travel, it's important to do additional things because there are many additional exposures in airplane travel and long distance car travel that add to the burden. So there can be some separate protocols that uh, help people along those lines, many of which you talk about, um, just used more regularly or um, in greater quantity because of uh, the exposure that's happening during that time. Yes. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about hormone replacement. So what are your thoughts on the safety of bioidentical hormone replacement? And do, would you ever recommend that? Um, I rarely recommend it because I rarely find it necessary. Okay. There are certain situations. There is some very fascinating um, stuff coming out about the use of uh, in, in certain situations that involve great toxicity, mitochondrial damage, uh, those, those types of very complicated sets uh, of pregnenolone. Uh, in in uh, certain types of suspensions being extremely helpful, okay? I never say never, I never say always, um, but um, uh, obviously synthetic hormones are just n not a good idea because they all lift estrogen reception, all of them. Doesn't matter what which one it is, doesn't have to just be estrogen. But when I do use bioidentical hormones, it's very short term, okay? And it's primarily uh, to help a person who's just so symptomatic, so unhappy with where they sit, that we can get some short term support while we work underneath yes. to, to, to correct all of the metabolics, all of the glandular function, moving the toxins, because this all takes time. Yes, right? it does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm all for band aids too, uh, symptomatic relief while you're working on yeah. the metabolism and detoxification, because, like you said, it does take time and people just want to feel better. And I think there's nothing wrong with that, you yeah. know, in the interim. 
I don't either. I don't either. And it's a case by case kind of a thing. In some cases, uh, it's going to contribute to the problem potentially. So I just have to assess that carefully. But um, it, it's really interesting also that uh, during that time I mentioned where I was uh, functioning primarily with uh, people one on one, face to face, and using the uh, physical assessment system. Many of my clients were women in their 40s and 50s experiencing hormonal changes and had gone for bioidentical hormone replacement because it became very popular uh, during those years. And every single one of them said the same thing. It worked for three months, maybe up to six months, mm. and then it just quit working. Interesting. I felt... I felt the same as I did before, or I felt worse. There is a reason for that, okay? Yes. So that's where I caution people against seeing that as, as really a, a solution. Yes. It, yeah. it, it is a great bridge in many cases, yeah. Why don't you tell the listeners where they can uh, learn more about you and how they can work with you? Sure, love to. Um, I am at uh, truenaturehealthconsulting.com. And um, I uh, love working with this situation. I love working with toxicity and overall metabolic improvement, period. I support everything Wendy is talking about mm -hmm. these days. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Julie, for coming on the show and talking to us about this very, very important subject, estrogens and xenoestrogens. Estrogen mimicking toxins are everywhere in our environment and we need to have yeah. awareness around them and prevent, you know, or stop from them from, you know, putting them in our body. Uh, so right. thank you so much for talking to us about this subject. Thank you. And thanks for all you're doing too, Wendy. Yeah, thank you. And everyone, mm -hmm. thank you so much for tuning in today to the podcast. Uh, please go on iTunes and take a couple seconds to leave a review. I would appreciate it so, so much. And you can learn more about me and learn, you know, I have 250 podcasts. I have hundreds of articles on my website on myersdetox.com. And also, if you want to learn about all my top 10 tips to detox like a pro, you can download my free checklist at Detox for Energy. Dot com. Thanks so much for tuning in.